evening. I am so excited to welcome Kate Anderson, resident at Cornell, and Laura Donaldson, retired Cornell professor and dog behavior consultant, here to talk to us about dog aggression. And I am not going to spend a lot of time talking. I'm Nancy. I'm representing Great Barrington Kennel Club. I'm going to flip it over right to Laura and then Kate so they can have as much time as they need. Thank you so much for coming, guys. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, dog aggressive behavior is, uh, it, of course, it's always been around, but I think in the last several years, maybe over the last decade, uh, there's been a really renewed interest in it, partly because of uh, breed specific legislation initiatives, partly because of the pandemic. Um, so I, I hope that uh, this will be helpful for all of you, especially those of you who are teaching classes, maybe working with clients or who are struggling with this in your own dogs. Um, so I am going to share the screen here. I'm going to dinner yet. Uh, bring up my presentation. And um, so this is just going to be very general. Um, canine aggression. And honestly, I don't like to use that word. <laughs> aggression, uh, partly because it's very misleading, tends to be used very monolithically, uh, but also because it has become so culturally and emotionally laden in a negative way in our uh, society, in uh, US society, particularly. Um, but I'm going to talk a little about that in a, in a minute. Um, I am a, as Nancy said, a retired Cornell professor. My favorite course there was a teaching a course called Gone to the Dogs, the Canine and Literature and Culture, where we read everything. We read neuroscience. We read ethology. We read fiction. Great fun. Great fun. I'm also a certified dog behavior consultant through the IAABC, uh, Karen Pryor, certified training partner, and I'm a certified control unleashed instructor. Um, I've included my contact information. So if you have any questions after the presentation, you know, three weeks from now, you wake up with a question about dog aggression, I, I would love for you to contact me uh, and, um, you know, just feel free to do that either through email or through my website, fourpawsfordirections.com. So just as, to interject here, yeah. if you have questions, please keep them general and do not ask about specific dog situations or situations specific to your dog. It's a little hard for either Kate or Laura to address specific situations without knowing more. So if you have questions, you're, we're happy to have you interject. Just make sure that they are more general and we appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, great. That's very actually important. Um, so uh, the first thing to know is that aggression is a behavior. It, it's not a mental state or character flaw, which is how uh, actually a fair number of people treat this term. And it's a normal evolutionary behavior in dogs. Every dog on the planet comes equipped to use aggressive behavior uh, given a certain set of circumstances. It's hardwired and every dog, that's why they have canine teeth. That's why they come with growls. Um, it's part of their normal behavioral repertoire. But it becomes a problem 
when dogs begin using it habitually to resolve conflicts, protect access to resources, or defend territory. Uh, so it's when dogs begin using this behavior on a daily basis uh, to, uh, to resolve problems or respond to conflicts that it becomes an issue. Um, I do wanna say that using aggressive behavior does not make a dog mean or vicious. It instead means that the dog is likely experiencing high levels of fear, anxiety, and stress. And one way to think about this is that dogs use behavior to seek relief. Uh, and behavior, so-called problems, quote unquote, are usually problems because the dog is using them to seek relief for anxiety, stress, fear, issues, um, and, and other kinds of emotional um, upheaval. Uh, and so in that sense, aggressive behavior is a coping mechanism. That's how I look at it. It's a coping mechanism that is seeking relief, most likely for high levels of fear, anxiety, and stress, although a small number of dogs uh, have neurological issues, they have medical issues, they are experiencing pain because pain is a, a very, I would say, underdiagnosed reason for dogs using aggressive behavior. Um, I'm a visual learner. <laughs> So I try to have a visual, uh, you know, something visual for every concept. And I love this particular one. It comes from Dr. Emily Levine, who is a veterinary behaviorist in New Jersey. And it shows you uh, most people, partly because of this word aggression, it's a single word, uh, think that uh, aggression is actually a much more simple behavior than it actually is. But you can see here underlying it is a whole network of interlocking circles, um, including genetics, physiology, environment, social interactions, early litter experience, even in utero uh, experience can have an effect on a dog developing aggressive behavior and using it habitually as an adult. But of course, embedding all of this is learning. Um, aggression is, is almost always a learned behavior. That is dogs learn that it works. Growling, barking, lunging are stop signals that are often very effective. And, and biting is even more effective. Um, they, they learn this. And I would say after two, or two times or three times, it's already a deeply embedded habit for that dog. And so when I work with aggressive dogs, one of the first things we do is um, teach them alternate behaviors because you can't once a dog has learned that aggression works, there's no way to unlearn that. And that's why I would say, and I know that Kate would agree with this, uh, once a dog uses aggression on an habitual basis, there's no 100% cure. Uh, but you can significantly improve the behavior perhaps to the point where someone who didn't know the dog and the dog's history might think, well, you know, what a well-behaved dog. Um, but given a certain set of circumstances, dogs will revert to using that habitual behavior again. Uh, and this is, uh, again, about this term aggression, 
it's actually a really diverse cluster of behaviors. It's not a lump sum because you often hear, and I'm sure all of you who are watching have heard, well, you, you have an aggressive dog or my dog is aggressive. You know, when people tell me that, it says actually nothing to me. I always have to ask, okay, give me detail. What is the dog doing? For how long? What's going on before? What's, how do you respond to it? Um, there are many behaviors in a continuum on, uh, on the aggression spectrum and they include, for instance, growling. That's a pretty familiar one. Tooth displays of varying degrees. This is dogs showing their weapons. Muzzle punching, um, which is probably not that common, but there are dogs who use it. And this is not a tar you know targeting a nose touch. This is like a knockout punch. Very forceful, and it can leave deep, deep bruising, snarling, air snapping, that is snapping without contact, kind of away from the intended uh, victim, so to speak. Certain forms of barking and lunging, because not all barking and lunging is aggressive. And then, of course, biting with and without injury. Um, there, there are whole volumes written on bites in dogs, the history of bites, their, uh, their bite graphs that describe how serious bites are. I, I don't think, at least I'm not going to really get into that, but if you have questions about bites, feel free to ask them after our presentations. And here are some signals that might be familiar, um, uh, aggressive behavior in dogs, uh, some of which I think uh, are pretty obvious and some of which aren't. Uh, whale eye is one that is obvious if you're looking for it, that is where the sclera, the whites of the dogs eyes are showing because usually they're not and it's a sure sign of arousal, a freeze. And I, I actually work with my clients to recognize what I call a dog's micro freezes because that is usually often where a dog's aggressive behavior begins. And if you can recognize the early signs, that gives you the opportunity to intervene early before a problem ensues. Um, you know, like I mentioned, showing teeth, curled lips, tense mouth, of course, growling, air snapping, um, barking and, and lunging. Uh, the thing about dogs is they are brilliant readers of us. They, they're just brilliant readers of humans. We humans, on the other hand, are kind of mediocre readers of our dog's behavior. And we probably recognize the big stuff if a dog is growling at me or, uh, or barking at me. But what we really need to be tuned into are the early signs, especially when it pertains to aggressive behavior. Because as I said, that's your best chance of intervening before a problem develops. And I always get this question, <laughs> do dogs bite out of the blue? Or someone will say, well, my dog is just biting out of the blue. And my answer is always no, no dog ever bites out of the blue. But um, sometimes if we have punished the threat displays, Dogs learn that giving clues, growling, barking, lunging, all of those cluster of behaviors uh, doesn't work as a stop signal. If people punish the threat displays, mistakenly believing that that is the problem, 
Uh, yes, you could have a dog who doesn't give any warning and bites be, uh, out of silence, and then you really have a, uh, a, a problem. Um, there are always cues and signals unless these have been punished or otherwise suppressed. And it's our job to recognize the dog's cues and signals. And this is a poster I often give to clients. Growling is a warning. Actually, I view growling as your best friend. This is your dog giving you a clue. I'm stressed out. I'm uncomfortable. Don't come any closer. Stop what you're doing. It is actually meant to avoid aggression, avoid a conflict, not initiate it. So you don't want to ignore it for sure, but do not punish it. Don't shout. Shouting has never helped one uh, dog who's struggling with aggression ever. In fact, what it usually does is escalate. Don't punish the dog. Um, keep calm because dogs don't bite if we are listening to their communication. Um, and then you should call a trained professional like Kate or myself, uh, because you really don't want to be dealing with aggressive behavior on your own unless you are very sure that what you're doing is going to be effective. Um, I'm going to wrap up here just by talking really briefly about a program that I have developed. Um, and I am going to include a link to several conference presentations I've done on it uh, that you, you could access if you are interested in finding out more. But it's my slow thinking is life saving for dogs program, and uh, it is both a behavior program, but I'm also developing an online course for it. And this is uh, operating on um, the assumption that aggressive behavior, actually in humans and dogs, comes from the emotions, yes but just as frequently it results from the faulty cognitive processing of social information and the inaccurate reading of external social cues. So a lot of uh, dogs with aggression issues that I work with are doing what I call really bad risk assessment. They're reading the social cues um, and environmental information wildly inaccurately and often in a very distorted fashion. So my program actually focuses on the cognitive part of uh, aggressive behavior in dogs. And it highlights the positive impact of teaching slow thinking. And I use various uh, games and and um, and exercises, relaxation techniques uh, to teach dogs cognitive reappraisal, how to reframe, problem solve, uh, and actually interpret environmental uh, information much more accurately. And I've been very excited about the both the response and the results. So uh, with that, I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to Kate. Thanks, Laura. All right. This is always um, my tense moment trying to share my screen effectively. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys see the, uh, yes. the title slide? Okay. Yes. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Kate Anderson. Um, I'm a veterinarian and a resident with the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Um, I graduated from Cornell in 2008, the vet school, and I've primarily been working in private practice in upstate New York since that time. 
Um, I started my residency in 2017, 18, around there. And I currently see behavior cases at Cornell. Um, and prior to COVID, I was seeing them in private practice as well, but I've kind of consolidated for the time being. Um, and I have to admit that talking about aggression is always something that made me a little bit anxious, which is why I chose this picture for the title slide. I feel like it's a minefield. There's a lot of emotions involved. And I always felt like I could never adequately help those patients as a veterinarian. Um, and I, I knew that most aggressive behavior that I saw um, stemmed from fear and anxiety. And I really wanted to learn more about that because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation. Um, my interest in behavior goes back over 20 years when I was a volunteer at the San Francisco SPCA. Um, and they had a behavior staff there at the time, which has really grown. I, I wish I had a chance to go back and visit. Um, but that was the first time I encountered a dog that was euthanized for behavioral reasons. Um, so tonight, I'm just going to give a brief overview of aggression in dogs from my perspective as a veterinarian and resident um, training in clinical behavior practice. All right, so I always have to start out by saying that um, any change in your pet's behavior is an indication for a good physical exam as well as additional diagnostics if indicated or recommended um, if possible. Um, there are so many things that can go into mood and any condition that leads to an increase in pain, like Laura mentioned, discomfort, irritability, that can lead to anxiety and fear of being handled or approached, um, possibly aggressive behavior, depending on, on the dog, um, diseases of the sensory system, the internal organs, the nervous system, endocrine and metabolic diseases, things that affect hormones, aging, they can all contribute to changes in behavior. So I'm not going to specifically address all of those medical causes for aggression today. Um, but this is something I always think about um, whenever I'm diagnosing um, the underlying cause of aggression, because aggression in and of itself is not a diagnosis. It's just a collection of symptoms. Um, so why do we care about aggression in dogs? Um, and why do most veterinary behaviorists, I think, um, I did the numbers recently for a study and I think over 20 years at Cornell um, of the cases I could access, I couldn't get 100% of them, but 70, over 70% 70 were, um, you know, the chief complaint was aggressive behavior. Um, and I think that's primarily um, because of safety. You know, I think you're more likely to act on a problem if there's a safety concern for humans or dogs in the environment. Um, and it's a public health risk and it puts the dog at risk of, of relinquishment or euthanasia as well. So I think that um, we have to think about both those things. Um, and it's important to realize like Laura commented, any dog can bite. There's no such thing as bad aggressive dogs and good dogs that would never bite. Um, it's not a label for who that dog is. Um, I'll talk a little more about that, but you know, no dog is 100% aggressive all the time. They, they may just have a lower threshold for displaying that behavior because of an underlying issue. Um, but unfortunately, the best predictor of a future bite is the history of a bite, um, what, like Laura said, once they learn that. Um, the statistics here um, are sort of the, the statistics a lot of people put down when they talk about dog bites. Um, unfortunately, they're a bit dated and they're likely underreported. So 4.7 million dog bites per year in the US. Um, let me just move this over. About 80% by a familiar dog. Um, and 12 to 20 people killed each year. Um, there's really not much information beyond that fact. You know, we don't, we don't really record anything else. I think we do know that young children are more likely to be bitten on the head and neck. Um, that's something I think that's been looked at. Um, and this is something Laura touched on. This is kind of my version of that visual um, when I was sort of starting my residency and trying to think about all these things because behavior is complicated. There's no one thing that goes into a behavior. It's, it's dynamic and, and it's, it's constantly moving, but it's an interplay of learning, environment, um, you know, early life experiences. Um, today, I'm gonna focus more on the brain development and hormones amongst some other factors as well. <laughs> Just let me interject. We're hearing some feedback. Could everyone make sure that they're muted, please? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is sort of going back to what I was talking about before. So before I talk about different types of aggression, I wanted to share this graphic from Susan Friedman at Behavior Works. Um, she's at, I believe, at the University of Utah still. It's been several years since I took her course. Um, and she talks about 
the importance of not using labels um, and remembering that what an animal does is not who they are. Um, it could be convenient to use labels, that's for sure. You know, if people were really vague about why they were coming to see me, it would be harder sometimes to get to the bottom line. But at the same time, I want people to realize that their dog is not an aggressive dog in all, all the time, every, you know, in every interaction. Um, it's not helpful, you know, and it sets up a dynamic where you, um, you just constantly are suspicious of that dog or worried about specific behaviors or you have an expectation of what that dog's gonna do. Um, like Laura said, you wanna start by talking about the specific behaviors that you're seeing and the context that those behaviors are happening in. Um, and you need to think about, you know, verb or an action. So you, you, we as humans are quick to jump to agitation or they're being pushy or they're doing this. And, and we have this wonderful social relationship with dogs. And I think we love to talk about their behavior in that way, but um, clinically it's really helpful to really talk more about what the dog is doing without applying our own assumptions. Um, and it, like I said before, it can cause self-fulfilling prophecies. So we, we sort of develop this expectation if anyone's interested, um, Susan's course, I think is open uh, to many different sectors. I think she has living and learning with animals and several, they're remote, she's always done them remotely and they're like usually six week courses. So um, this is something that I struggle with, you know, how do we diagnose aggression? Um, it, it's very difficult, you know, in and of itself, aggression is not a diagnosis and we're, the goal would be to, be able to figure out the underlying emotion or motivation, what's going on in the brain, the neurochemical um, factors, um, but we don't always have that information and dogs unfortunately can't tell us specifically in plain words. Uh, and even if they could, it might be difficult to interpret. So it, just like it's challenging with humans sometimes to diagnose specific psychiatric disorders. Um, this is one helpful way to at least start to navigate that, to think about the target or the function. Um, so that you can think about it. But of course, you know, because I think anxiety or fear could be in a lot of these. That's why this kind of frustrates me. Um, so, you know, there's human directed, dog directed, and then sort of other species. Um, conflict related is more towards familiar people. Resource guarding is over resources. But fear based, I mean, I think I see fear in other forms as well. So that kind of frustrates me. But that's sort of traditionally what people have done territorial. Um, status related is more between two dogs rather than humans. Um, hopefully in veterinary behavior, we'll make more progress with this in the future as we find better ways to make a diagnosis. Um, right now we don't have a perfect way and most experts don't agree and um, the terminology varies depending on who you're talking to, which is why it's so important to talk about specific behaviors that you're seeing. This is another complicated topic. Um, we don't really have all the answers about this yet. A lot of the studies that are out there directly um, contradict each other, um, but sex and aggression definitely has a role. Um, there's a lot of research now going on looking at age of spay neuter and orthopedic diseases and um, cancer. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of that. that. That makes it even more complicated. I'm gonna stay in my lane and stick to behavior, but um, you know, unfortunately, I think one thing to take away from the research is that we, we know a lot less than we thought. And many times people mistakenly think that spaying or neutering a dog will, will minimize the risk of aggression. And that's not always the case. Um, I think for other reasons, it's important to talk to your vet about when it's appropriate to spay neuter your dog and make a decision on an individual basis. Um, there's some thought that maybe male dogs are more often aggressive towards humans than females. Um, many, uh, studies report that with two dogs in the home that are fighting, it's more often spayed females, but it's hard. You know, there, there could be another study that contradicts that, but that's generally what you find in the literature and intact males will often fight as well. And like Laura said, you know, this is often sometimes normal behavior, but unwanted and can become habitual based on the environment. Um, like I was not to switch species or switch gears too much, but I was listening to an interview with an expert on urban rats. And he said, after COVID, when the garbage bags weren't being put out, all the rats started fighting because they didn't have any food, you know? So it can be hard. So that's sometimes what can happen depending on your situation. Um, I, I just think the bottom line is to not assume that spaying or neutering will reduce aggression, which is I think an unfortunate assumption that a lot of people make. Um, there 
is a critical development period in dogs. We do talk a lot about this and, and obviously there's more that goes into the development of a puppy than just this period. And, and, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, but generally speaking, there is this sort of more special period of puppies between about four to 14 weeks. It varies a little bit depending on who you're, you talk to, but um, experiences during this time will, you know, more greatly affect adult behavior, uh, more often what they are acclimated to and get used to. So I think more often we see omission of experience. A lot of times there's a tendency to say they were abused as a puppy, that's why they're so fearful. But I think more often what happens is they just never, they've never experienced it during their early life. And so they struggle to adjust, but a lot of dogs will be around things they didn't experience as a puppy and adjust. So I think it, it's, it's not an absolute. Um, in my caseload, what I see most often is dogs at social maturity, about eight to 24 months. Um, this is often when we could have a, you know, to all, everyone's eyes, maybe even an expert, a normal puppy, but then maybe we see here the first growl or have the first situation where they seem a little bit unsure. And that's when we start to see some behavior problems. And that's very difficult to predict. Um, one other thing I guess I should comment in the socialization period, um, if they have, you know, the things I think that can contribute to problems are an extremely fear producing experience. If a puppy's orphaned um, or if they have a, a severe illness as a puppy. So like a puppy that um, contracted parvovirus and spent many weeks in a hospital isolated, um, that might contribute to behavior problems later on. So even though we can't, um, look at a puppy and make a prediction about what they're gonna be like as an adult. And believe me, people have tried and people want to because that would be very helpful, especially for working dogs and, and assistance dogs. If we could predict which puppies were gonna be better at their job, it would be very helpful. Um, but we, we really don't have a reliable way. No, no science or, or study has ever really proven that. Um, but one thing I think is really important to realize is that we can identify outlier puppies. So those are puppies that are already showing signs of extreme stress and that don't have the ability to cope in situations like other puppies. Um, so, you know, they might get startled and just not recover, go hide under a chair and stay there. Whereas another puppy would go, ah, and then they would kind of go back to their loosey goosey puppy behavior, sniffing everything, all the great things that puppies do. Um, so this study looked at 102 puppies, eight to 16 weeks. Um, and it was uh, in an, a veterinary clinic. Um, and I think they had them on the floor. I forget exactly what the startling thing was. They might've dropped something on the floor or something like that. Um, anyway, they identified 10% of the puppies to be sort of outliers. Um, they, they cataloged a bunch of different behaviors. Um, interesting to note that 60% of the puppies that were outliers panted. So a panting puppy in a situation, I guess would be something helpful to look for. Um, and the really interesting part is that they followed those puppies up and they're a year later and there was no improvement. And I think, you know, this is just one study, it's not a be all end all, but I do think it's important to take away that a lot of people think puppies are gonna grow out of things. They're gonna, oh, it's just a puppy, they'll get used to it. We just have to keep trying. Um, and really we have, those are the puppies that need help immediately. It's an emergency. We have to get those puppies in and get treatment because they have a risk of continuing to grow into that problem and not getting better. And then it's been a year and it's even harder um, to help them at that point. Um, so it's important to learn to look at body language of puppies and know what's normal, that puppies should be like little noodles and their, their tails should be at 90 degrees to their body, depending on their breed. Um, they should be exploring, you know, looking at everything, you know, comfortable approaching things, you know, just practice looking at puppies and look for the puppy that's hiding under a chair the whole time and, and is really reluctant to approach. Um, it's the, the behavior in the brain is something I think I didn't want to get too deep into all of this, but I think one common thing I hear is like, oh, my, my dog has selective hearing is he doesn't listen to me. You know, he's not doing what I say. Um, and there's lots, there could be lots of reasons for that from, you know, just not having learned that behavior well enough, not generalizing. Um, but it's important to remember that um, one reason might be that highly arousing experiences can activate the limbic system, which overrides thinking or logical part of the brain. Um, so, you know, they're not going to be able to listen to you because they're too anxious in that moment. Um, and fear has a 
you know, evolutionary function of a behavioral response that allows an animal to avoid an actual or perceived threat. So there's a reason that they have that, but it's, it's, it's frustrating because you feel like they're not listening or they're not doing something you want them to change in that moment. Um, whereas anxiety is the anticipation of an adverse event based on a previously negative experience. So uh, for example, a lot of dogs come into the vet clinic anxious because they remember last time they had a shot or, or they had their temperature taken. Um, and then emotions are an integral part of the stress response. So um, stressful experience, while a stressful experience can impair cognitive abilities and memories of specific events, it can even affect like positive experiences. Um, but mild stress is crucial for focusing attention and promoting learning. Um, but intense stress can just lead to a purely emotional response. Um, so it's important to remember that during training. Um, and stress is a risk factor for disease and behavior problems too, which is finally starting to be talked about in veterinary medicine, especially pets that are in the ICU or undergoing like a lot of, um, you know, difficult medical issues. I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of veterinary medicine, you know, we, we were there with pain a while back, you know, now there's more recognition of pain. I mean, it hasn't been that long that people didn't think babies felt pain. So I guess, you know, we're, we got to come along some way, but um, now they're starting to recognize the effect stress has on healing and all of those things as well. So I think the bottom line that I take away from it and try to remember is that one negative experience can condition a fear response. Um, so even though dogs don't generalize very well on behaviors that we're teaching them, they seem to really generalized fear. Um, and I think that's probably protective over evolution, but it's frustrating because I wish they didn't do it so well sometimes. Um, but learned fear results in fidgeting, escape attempts and or aggression um, and fear, anxiety and stress can affect learning. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into medications. Um, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit because I think it's a common question that I get when people come to see me and you know, I have the, the whole gamut of responses from, yes, my dog needs medication now to we don't, we don't want his personality to change. Will he have to be on it for the rest of his life? Um, we don't want to mask the problem. We don't want to suppress his behavior. Um, those are all really good questions. Um, but I think it's, it's important to realize that, you know, we still, well, we still have a lot to learn. Um, I think we do know that medication can decrease fear and anxiety and facilitate learning. We know that some medications that we use in behavior improve cognition and do help dogs help their brain learn a different way to respond, especially when you combine it with behavior modification um, and help you know set them up and make the right behavior easier. Um, they can be useful for specific situations like le leash reactivity. Um, they can improve an animal's well-being overall if they're just generally anxious. Um, and then there's diseases like cognitive dysfunction where we don't really have a perfect pharmaceutical solution, but um, some behavior problems are due to underlying pathology. And drugs should never ever be used in the absence of safety, management, avoidance of behavior modification, which is why I think it's hard for general practitioners to do all that in the space of sort of the regular vet visit because um, you know, there's that reluctance to give a medication without having all those in place because you're less likely to be successful. And then that, you know, there's a liability of giving that medication and expecting it to do more than it really can. I remember I had a client when I was a general practitioner who was very upset because she had an invisible fence and an ag a large aggressive St. Bernard and she wanted a medication for the dog because he was biting people coming to the house, but she wouldn't keep him inside. And I was like, I'm not going to give you medication is not going to stop him from happening if you don't manage him. So she was very upset with me because she felt like the medication would fix the problem. And um, while I do think medications can help, it's important to realize they're not a cure-all. You know, they, they, they have their place and they should be used appropriately. Um, and they can be very useful. The other thing that's hard about um, treating dogs for behavior problems is it's very confusing. You know, there's so many people, it's kind of like nutrition, there's a lot of emotion and minefields and discussing it. Um, and you don't know who a behaviorist is. Um, and the, someone posted this on Facebook. So I th just thought I'd share, you know, that it's kind of a tongue in cheek kind of little flow chart. Um, but don't be afraid to ask questions, um, you know, and, and figure out who's helping you, what's their background. Unfortunately, veterinary or not veterinary, um, animal behavior, especially dog training has kind of this guru effect and people like to feel like they're you know, talking to this expert or someone who's really charismatic. Um, 
and there really are no guarantees. So, I, and it's important to realize that there is science behind all this. So it's, it's good to, um, you know, make sure that you're getting the right information. Um, and that is nothing more frustrating than talking to someone who's spent hours and hours working on something and it's really just made their, their dog worse. And that's the other thing too, is you could be getting wonderful advice, but if your dog isn't getting better, then you have to kind of stop and reevaluate, you know, where's the disconnect. Um, when Laura was talking, there was one other resource I wanted to mention and now I'm blanking on it, but um, Decoding Your Dog by the um, American College of Veterinary Behaviorists, I would recommend. There's also now Decoding Your Cat, if you're a cat person. Um, uh, let's see, the IAABC, which is the International Association of Animal Behavior, has a statement on the um, least intrusive, minimally aversive, um, Laura probably knows more about that than I do, method of training, but Susan Friedman talks about that in her course. Um, and the um, American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, ABSAB, has several position statements on the use of punishment, socialization, um, several that are helpful on there and then the SF, SPCA about prong and shock collars. Um, if that's something that interests you, there's a lot of really good information and studies that have been done there. And there was one other one, oh, um, I know what it was. Um, I don't know if anyone has extra time. I know there's a podcast for every po single thing on the planet right now. <laughs> it seems like everyone has a podcast or is on a podcast, but um, there's a veterinary behaviorist in the UK named Danny Mills who started a podcast um, I think he started last fall, kind of during the pandemic. Um, and he talks to different veterinary behaviorists or people that have influenced his career. He talks to some trainers. So it's a really interesting show. It's long and kind of rambling. Um, so you might want to do it when you have extra time on your hands. But he, um, yeah, he interviews um, Dr. Haupt, who is one of the founders of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists on the first one. And um, and then I think he, all, you know, I, I know why it came up, Laura, because he interviewed a guy who studies, uh, it's really kind of gruesome, but no one had ever done it, surprisingly. He studies the dogs that have actually um, been involved in human fatalities and um, tries to figure out what happened in that situation. So that one was a little bit horrifying, but it was interesting. So I think that's all I had. That must have been Jim Crosby. Yes. That's who that was. <laughs> and Gene Donaldson is on it. And um, yeah, it's it's an interesting, you know, maybe maybe I'm only interested because it's all about veterinary behavior, which I could listen <laughs> to for hours. Maybe it wouldn't interest, but it's a, it's yeah, he talks to um, Ian Dunbar from yeah. who's British, but he he has a training school in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting podcast. All right, let me, should I stop sharing my screen? You can if you want. Oh. If anyone wants the um, resources, I could share those later. So I just have one request before we begin uh, our freewheeling question and answer. <laughs> session and that is when you're um, asking a question could you show your video I, I always like to be talking like face to face um, you know rather than to a name on a screen so if people don't mind doing that that'd be great so the floor is open for questions <laughs> Now you've made them all shy, Laura. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Laura. Yeah. For both of you. Um, do you think that there are dogs, and I, and I know that you touched on this, but um, I started to think about a professor and something that he had taught to me. And I, I think I zoned out trying to figure out what his perspective was on it. So for that, I apologize. But do you believe that there are dogs who genetically are simply too aggressive and react impulsively and cannot be treated with medication, behavior uh, modification and have to be euthanized? So, and again, I'm sorry if I missed it, said that, but I just started thinking about him in my head. 
Uh, well, let, let me just say, are there dogs that are born with screws loose? Yes. I mean, that's a very non-scientific response. Are there dogs that have neurological issues that predispose them to this kind of behavior? Yes, but I would say they are extremely rare. They're rare. And, and I, I've never uh, worked with one. I've worked with dogs that uh, I think both Kate and I have mentioned that actually pain, for example, is a uh, really underdiagnosed etiology for aggressive behavior. Um, so th there are neurobiological reasons <laughs> that dogs use aggression, but, um, you know, are there, are there dogs that just can't learn? I'm sure there are. I, I think they are extremely rare. And I do think some people like to not, not you, I'm, I'm just making this as a general statement, um, especially in relation to the breed specific legislation, all that kind of stuff which is which is now dialed back a little bit thank goodness um that you know you have whole breeds that are just beyond training and i don't accept that um i i do think that genetics i think breed characteristics are very important i am part of a movement to go beyond the current behaviorist paradigm uh, and take all of that into consideration. But, um, you know, I'm sure there are dogs like you describe. I just think they are much rarer than, uh, than we might think. I don't know. What's your, what's your take on that, Kate? I just, I do want to just say that he believes, this professor believes that it's, it's extremely rare as well. Well, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think that it's very complicated and we're, we still don't know the genetic contribution, but if we could snap our fingers and control the breeding of every pet dog in the US, you know, we might, you know, the, it, it, it would, it's not going to affect everything. It's may, I've heard maybe the range of 30 to 50% is what effect genetics has on behavior. So it's really hard because you, you're talking about, you're not talking about like one factor and then how that's going to play out it's you take that genetics in that dog and you put it in a specific environment and then there's influences from the womb to early life experiences so all of those things combined might predispose a dog to um, bite in a certain situation um, or be more irritable or less tolerant of different things um, but you could take the same dog in a different setting and maybe that would never happen. So it's, it's really, yeah, I think it's exceedingly rare for it to, for there to be a dog who's like Jeffrey Dahmer or the serial killer of yeah. dogs. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think, unfortunately, some dogs, you know, you're not, it's not ever just about the dog. You've got people in the house um, and some dogs, some dogs that I know live with people that are able to manage them and they're okay with that. Whereas if they were in a home with three small children, that wouldn't be, possibly, you know, and they're 150 pound Mastiff, that family may choose to euthanize. So euthanasia doesn't always reflect exactly the severity of the situation. And in, in, it's not always just about the dog. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, it's difficult to know that. But I agree. I think it's, it's exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I, have, I have a question for you, Sheila. What would be the stakes in answering that for you? What, what are the stakes in that question for you? I, I think that this, um, that he was kind of devastated as someone who worked with dogs for decades, um, that he came across a dog that had to be put down, that, you know, there was just no ideology to how this dog mm -hmm. was acting. There was no understandable signal. There mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it was just really a, a very bad situation. And I think that there had been, and I'm, I could be wrong, but I think there had been multiple uh, households that attempted to address the problem 
and there was not any significant change, that it was just a consistent and very aggressive, right? We don't want to use that word, right? But yeah. It, there was a consistency of this dog's aggressive behavior towards humans that was, it just was unmanageable. And this is someone who's extremely knowledgeable. And, um, and I, I just think it, it bothered him a lot that there was yeah. no there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I have actually, and I'm sure Kate has too, I've worked with the dog, you know, most of my clients, um, dogs are struggling with the aggression and I've worked with dogs where the program hasn't worked, <laughs> you know, so you work with the dog for a year. Um, just, just a few months ago, this is a dog I had worked with for a year and a half. He made progress in certain areas, but the bottom line was when push came to shove, he would bite and they had a busy household with teenagers in and out lots of people visiting. And so they love the dog to bits that, you know, but uh, they just made the decision. This dog would never, ever, ever be safe enough. And I think that, but that's a very different question than, um, you know, are there dogs that are just aggressive because they have neurological, you know, their brain isn't working right. Um, there, there are a lot of failures working with aggressive dogs. And those of us who work with clients whose dogs are struggling with this, we need to, we often need to do a lot of psychological work ourselves <laughs> because um, you, you have a, there is a failure rate and you come to a place where you just have to say, okay, this dog, I love this dog, love this family, but the dog will never be safe enough actually in any family, in any home. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope we haven't depressed everyone <laughs> at the very beginning of the, <laughs> of the question. Somebody asked a really kind of innocuous question here. <laughs> I didn't break the group, did I? I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody asked me a question. Well, I'm willing to throw out a provocative statement. I think Sally just, uh, and that yeah. is, um, if you have an aggressive dog, the worst thing you can do is Google what to do about it. I'll just throw that out as a controversial statement. And then, yeah. I have a question. I have a question um, about managing your own dog, I guess. If you know that your dog has issues in certain situations um, and you seem to be managing it okay because you understand what the triggers are, um, how how much do you feel that you need then to go to somebody else or are you just being reasonably successful? That's all I have. I, yeah, I think it depends on um, a couple different things, but I think that if, if you, management is always like the first step in any problem and it's always a balancing act. So if it's a management that's easy to do, it's not problematic and there's not a huge risk, like you know, there, there isn't high stakes if management fails, then I think it's fine. I think that management can be part of treatment. You know, some people worry that they're avoiding the problem or they got their head in their sand because they're not addressing it head on, but dogs that don't aren't put in situations where they're gonna have problems are gonna do better. So, you know, I think that it's, it's complete personal preference at that point. I mean, there's definitely situations where I see things going on in a home and as a professional, I have to intervene and say the two-year-old can't, be playing in your English Mastiff's food bowl while he's eating like that just can't happen I don't care how safe you think he is <laughs> like that's not okay but there are also other management things that I think are fine for 
you know, one person and work and as long, you know, I, I think that's reasonable. I think, I, I think that's the hard part too about diagnosing behavioral problems is there's a component of, you know, what's a problem for you as the person with the pet, you know, versus, you know, what's acceptable to one person may not be to an other, another. So is it, is it the dog's problem or the human problem that sometimes is hard to figure out? Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we're not talking about individual dogs, so yes, <laughs> but it was based on an individual dog. Yeah. Oh, Peter. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to uh, work with a dog, how to train a dog to try to get them more relaxed about situations. I'm thinking particularly uh, if you're walking a dog and the dog reacts to other dogs, uh, are there ways that you can train them that will help to reduce that if not eliminate it? You wanna start on that one, Lori, or I can if you want. Um, well, yeah, I, I will, so, there's no one size fits all. And I, so I'll just be honest and say that the traditional methods that you might use for the situation you're describing, which is uh, desensitization, counter conditioning have never worked that well for me. They are not, uh, they are not techniques that I use very often. Um, I, I prefer to teach dogs cognitive skills like disengagement. Um, I work a lot on relaxation techniques. I recommend that clients, for example, suspend leash walking. If you've got a dog who is spending the whole walk barking and lunging, why are you walking that dog? You need to take a step back and work on relaxation techniques, uh, give that dog a vacation from his triggers for a while so that you can do some foundational work. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't train by a kind of um, list. You've you really got to take into consideration the whole dog. So why is your dog barking and lunging? That is a that is a form of relief seeking. And it's different for every dog. So I I I think you're asking actually a much more complicated question than what do you use for a dog who's barking and lunging? It's what that behavior means for that dog, how it's helping them seek relief from the stress, anxiety, fear, whatever is motivating it. Um, and then I, I might be able to come up with a, you know, a program for, for your dog. Uh, but what I would not do is just launch into desensitization counter conditioning. Um, and I, I, you know, Kate has studied with the desensitization counter conditioning guru, Susan Friedman. So I don't know, you, you may have some different views on this, uh, but I, I tend to de-emphasize those methods and use others that I have found to be much more successful or workable. Well, I think it's important to remember too that when they're in that reactive mode, it's very hard to change the turn the ship around at that point. So like, like um, Laura said, you need to, you need to step back and work, you know, practice with that, you know, you practice for the moment, not in the moment. So in that moment where you're out on the walk and they're reacting, it's very, very difficult to change that response. Um, you know, you've got, it's like any skill, like like in vet school, they make you practice suturing on a piece of fabric or a fake skin. You know, they don't just send you into surgery and go, close up that incision, <laughs> you're all set. You know, you, you gotta practice. And I think that's true with dogs and it can get frustrating because that's a lot of dog training in general, even dogs that don't 
aren't prone to displaying aggressive behavior commonly. Um, it's something that I find hard is like working up to distractions with things that they know how to do well at home, but then you're like slowly working in different environments. Um, but it's similar to that, but it's just realizing that there's, there's not really any technique that's gonna suddenly turn that around in that moment. It's more finding those moments when they're far enough away, but noticing it that you can work on a different response um, and, and choosing, you know, and then having a way to pivot and move away from that situation mm -hmm. if needed. Um, and I think over time they start to generalize to more and more situations, but it takes a lot of um, practice and time and patience, which is frustrating. It's, it's a common problem. There's, you know, there's so many um, classes, reactive mm -hmm. rover classes. I think a lot of people, I, with the pandemic, I've seen a lot more reactive dogs too, because people mm -hmm. are out walking more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just spending a lot more time with their dogs so they're actually noticing their dog's behavior uh in many cases in detail <laughs> for the first time because we're around our dogs 24 7 now um but yeah i mean there and uh i i think that's where what kate just said um there, there's been this explosion of, of reactive dog classes, you know, and podcast, anything you can imagine, you can find it on the internet. And um, one answer, Peter, that I would give to your question is um, one of the worst ways to find a technique, and I want to go back to this, is to Google it, uh, is to look on on the internet, you're bound to get really bad information. And there is good information, but how do most people know? They're not, they don't have enough background to recognize the bad stuff. Um, and I actually just worked with a client. Um, we, we just finished up, her dog made fabulous progress, but she had a, a corgi, a herding dog, right? And we know herding dogs, are prone to uh, aggressive behavior of a certain kind, um, especially triggered by fast movement. They love to nip, you know, go for the heels, go for the pant leg. Uh, this was a resource guarding corgi. And she had worked with a dog trainer who had told her, I don't know who the trainer was or what their credentials were, but they had told her, yes, reach in the bowl when the dog is eating. That is a dog trainer, quote unquote, who told her that. And of course the owner got two hard bites from this dog. Uh, so I, I think the strategy you use to, um, you know, to work with a dog who's barking and lunging on leash I, I would just say, buyer beware, do your research. Try to, you know, try to uh, figure out what the approach is. Um, you know, what's their success rate? Do they use words? And Kate had this in her, that little um, handout. If they're using words like, we're gonna address this barking and lunging on leash by showing the dog who's boss, or this is a dominance issue, you just need to be the leader. For your dog, I would turn and run as, away as fast as I could. Um, so I, I think even trying to answer your question, it, it's, it's hard given the glut of information and a lot of it is just bad. And I think it's important to note that. I'll put, um, I put the resources in the chat. The app, um, ABSAB has a position statement on choosing a trainer that's really helpful, like what questions to ask and sort of how to, how yeah. to figure out if they're a the good fit for you. Uh, let's see what they say. Any questions come up with the chat, Nancy, or no, I'm keeping, any? I'm keeping an eye on it, and not yet. You guys are so quiet. Yeah, come on. Oh. 
<laughs> you have the experts, yes. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, I've had a couple of people mention this to me recently. They have a young dog and they have an older dog and you know, the older dog is sort of winding down in life and they've noticed that the relationship has changed in be between the two dogs and the younger dog is getting a little bit, and I put this in quotes, aggressive. I would use the word assertive, but the, these folks have used the word aggressive. Can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a common problem when you have a, you know, even if they've lived together for a while and have a, seem to have a stable relationship as one dog ages, um, their body posture might change, their ability to respond. And especially if you have a young dog that's kind of reaching social maturity around that time, but even sometimes later, um, you can definitely see a change in a predictable relationship. Um, and I think that's hard for us as humans to understand. I don't know how well we take care of our, our elderly. I guess you can make an argument where we're not the best society for that, but we, we have a, you know, a soft, we have this idea of like dogs, you know, looking up to their elder dogs as, as leaders and protectors. But I think there definitely is, and it's dynamic too. It's not like they constantly have, you know, every situation there's one top dog, but I do see, um, younger dogs challenging the older dog. We've seen dogs, actually seen um, older dogs be uh, attacked or and one sadly was killed um, from having a seizure. But I think anytime an older dog is showing signs of illness or slowing down, sometimes that can trigger um, aggression. And, and there is you know definitely intervention and treatment needed at that point to keep everybody safe. It can be a really dangerous situation. Yeah. Yeah, those, the, the people who, uh, because I have an older dog and right, because I have an older dog, I'm the expert because my dog was aging before their dog. I don't know anything about this. Um, it's not reached that situation where the dogs are fighting. It just sounds to me like the, the younger dogs are sort of feeling their oats and pushing the boundaries. Yeah, I, I definitely think that happens. They'll defer to the older dog, you know, to one dog for a while and then they'll be like wait a second they're not so they're not going to be so quick to respond and 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 like if the younger dog is reaching social maturity that's kind of like they're testing the waters to see right. what they can do or not do right yeah and i think those of us who have reached a certain age can empathize with the <laughs> older dog <laughs> you know i i just have so much less patience for uh, for that. But it's interesting. I don't know how many of you, I, I'm surprised we haven't gotten a question about Major, right? Um, the, the Biden's dog in the White House, who's now out for training again, <laughs> uh, because he he's had a few uh, biting episodes. But um, Champ, the older dog in the White House. Uh, I don't know if you remember the controversy when some newscasters really disparaged him. You know, he's an older dog. He, he looks a little frailer, you know, because he is older. He's what, 13 or, and in a German Shepherd, that's I think I heard he was 14. I was like, oh, or God. 14. And I saw him like hobbling a lot. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I sometimes look in on the Facebook page of Champ and Major. And, um, you know, my comment was uh, we, we should treat older dogs like many cultures uh, treat older senior people as elders, not elderly. Uh, because they do have a certain wisdom. Uh, yeah, they can be crotchety, but I think they've been through a lot. They've survived. There's a lot they can teach a young dog, just like a, a, an elder who's a human can teach the rest of us quite a few things too. But I thought that was a really interesting um, kind of microcosm of some of the attitudes about aging whether in dogs or humans in our society. Uh, you know, I think some people have abandoned dogs when they get to be a certain age. And I just find that heartbreaking. 
Um, but anyway. So since you brought um, Major, Major. up. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> you opened the door, Laura. <laughs> what do you think about Major? What do you guys I think? love Major. I, I would take him in a heartbeat. I would. Uh, I, I do think, I mean, he, this is such a good example of, you know, dogs are creatures of habit, right? And so one day he's living in a very familiar environment. And the next day <laughs> he's in this chaotic, uh, you know, place called the White House. I can't imagine what it might be like to live there. I'd probably never sleep. Uh, but I think for major talk about your fear, stress, and anxiety. Um, I, I think he's a dog who probably, uh, was not socialized to deal with a lot of crowds, a lot of what we might call sudden environmental changes, <laughs> like a secret service agent suddenly coming around the corner. Um, but, uh, I think what's more interesting to me is not actually that Major has struggled and I hope he's getting help and I hope it's positive reinforcement and I hope they're not actually using the choke chain that he has on most of the time. I don't think they are with this training, uh, but I, what I found more interesting was the um, public reaction to it and um and and what people were saying on all sides you know across the spectrum about it and that's where this term aggressive reared its head again you know aggressive dog in the white house that that actually was one headline um so it's too bad they didn't send major to kate or me because, <laughs> because we there are veterinary behaviorists, I think, in the area that have reached, I've tried to reach out to them. I think Amy Pike did, but um, I was going to say, no, and I feel bad for President Biden because I see yeah. some statements from him that are trying to defend Major and say, really a lovable dog. And, that, and that's what a lot of my clients feel like. It's like they, they own this menace to society and they feel judgment. And <laughs> obviously, if there's a safety issue, you know, we don't want anyone getting, they have to take that exactly. seriously and protect the public. But um, at the same time, it doesn't mean you can't love a dog or have a bond with a dog if they've bitten someone it it just doesn't immediately put the stamp on them um and yeah I, I think more about our management of the dog rather than the dog you know we're putting the dog in that situation where they're like the white house where they're just not ready to exactly cope and they're yeah yeah so they hopefully they'll um i don't i'm a little skeptical i don't really know that much about the trainer that they went to but i'm a little worried about it well the 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 first trainer was a police dog trainer in Delaware. And you can read into that what you want. I think with the trainer in Washington, I don't know who it is, but um, I've heard assurances through very reputable people in the dog training community that it is positive reinforcement training. He's out of board and train situation, but this is a, this is a, to get back to Sheila's, question it's it's really interesting will major ever be able to live comfortably in a place like the white house he may not you know he may he might be much happier at home in delaware with just his immediate family and your normal amount of visitors and some predictable routines but put him in a totally chaotic place where you can't control anything He's a different dog. Yeah. Um, I I feel for him. I really do. Um, someone asked in the chat, um, what are some tips or resources to help with a fearful dog who has become increasingly bitey to humans and his fellow dogs, frequent injury to humans as his vision and hearing fades with old age? I employ a lot of environmental management and I'm at a complete loss with this. Um, I would say, well, I mean, if, you know, it's not, not going to be helpful in all cases, but depending on the situation um, and how much management is, is possible, um, you could consider 
um, basket muzzle training, if it's a situation where you can't supervise or you know, you're there, but you can't watch them, I guess it'd be helpful to know a little more if the bites were how severe they were. Um, I guess figuring out the specific triggers or when they seem to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I would also maybe, I don't know how old the dog is, but I would maybe talk to your vet about screening for cognitive dysfunction because it's not curable, but there are supplements you can give that can help slow down the progression. And we do see an increase in anxiety in dogs. And, and that might be normal aging, just that he's more sensory impaired, but sometimes, you know, it's, um, cognitive impairment in older dogs doesn't always just present as them walking into corners or doing sort of, um, you know, less play or the most common ones I think we see are sleep wake cycle but I see a lot of dogs who just suddenly become anxious at eight nine ten years of age. Yeah I was going to ask that because uh, several people who knew that I was hosting this today who couldn't be on said ask about canine cognitive cognitive dysfunction see if they can have any have any comments about that. Oh yeah, it's a really interesting um, disease. It's a it's I mean I don't love it because there's no cure but um, there, it can be used as a model. It's very similar to human Alzheimer's. So there's actually um, a lot of research in that area because I think they, um, they, they can study dogs um, and try to figure out how to treat it in dogs, but that's also useful for humans as well. There's a company in um, Canada called CanCog um, that has a population of geriatric beagles that um, live this very nice life where they all kind of run around, but they play games um, at different intervals. And it's like a cognitive test that tracks their aging and they they get excellent medical care. And when they die of, you know, whatever natural causes or, it, you know, if it's their time, um, I think they do then like look at their brain. Um, they get MRIs every year. Um, and so they're sort of tracking aging and looking at things that might be helpful um, in treating it. Um, it's it's underdiagnosed for sure because a lot of the things we see with canine cognitive dysfunction are, sometimes we attribute to just always just getting old or you know we don't really recognize it until it's more advanced. There are um, screening tools that you can um, complete, and it, most vets don't unfortunately. But like I think starting at you know, when they, some people say 10, but I think really seven or eight might be better. Um, you know, if you do the screening tool every year when you go to the vet or every six months, just to track how things are going. Um, the acronym, there's a couple of acronyms. There's a different one for cats and there's one for dogs because cats can get um, uh, cognitive dysfunction as well. We don't call it canine, but um, cats tend to vocalize more. Um, so for dogs, it's like disruptions in their sleep wake cycle. Um, changes in social interactions, um, getting disoriented, walking into the corner, trying to go out the door the wrong side, um, increased anxiety, especially noise phobia. Like I'll have some dogs suddenly at eight, nine, 10 years of age develop severe storm phobia when they really weren't that afraid of storms previously. Um, as far as treatment, there are supplements. Senolife is one I think that's on the market now. Um, Purina Bright Minds is an over-the-counter diet. So a lot of the treatment is based around supporting brain health with omegas and antioxidants. Um, and then there's Purina um, NeuroCare, which is a prescription diet and um, science diet BD, B as in boy, um, I think it's brain diet. <laughs> um, the, the study behind that is actually stronger than a lot of the supplements on the market for most behavioral things. Um, the, the food first, the, that was pretty good research that was done, but. Yeah, you can, and then there's a medication. There's an FDA approved um, medication for dogs called Selegiline, which is the brand name is Anapril. And I think that can help. It sort of plateaus, but it can improve things for a little bit of time. Mm. But there's so much more to learn about it. I do think that the issue of um, losing sensory function is another like pain. It's another one of these, um, I, I guess, motivations for or foundations for aggressive behavior that are often underlooked um, and 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 underdiagnosed. And I'll give you an example. I, I'm actually working right now with a. It's a Chihuahua mix who. Um, I mean, if this dog were 100, 100 plus pounds, he probably wouldn't have survived this long because 
he he's got a significant bite history. He, you know, he's just got bites in the dozens and they're for him quite serious, but a lot of them were occurring when, uh, when the dog would be startled, like someone would walk out of a hallway and the dog would just go into arousal mode. And then he learned to just attack that person. He would go for their feet. Um, similarly, if someone if he were sleeping, and this is true for a lot of dogs, and you reach down toward them, they startle. Um, and sometimes if they startle out of sleep, the first thing they do is they'll, they'll bite or, or nip. So I, um, I thought this was very interesting because it seemed to me it had a lot of visual impairment involved. Um, why was the dog startling when people walked out of a, a hallway from darkness to light? So they actually took the dog to a canine ophthalmologist, and it turned out um, he only had about 50% function in his eyes. And this was a rescue dog. They did, you know, the rescue hadn't diagnosed this, but um, I'm not sure what we can do about it <laughs> because as Kate said, there's honestly, when you've lost eye function, unless it's something like a cataract where you can do surgery there, there's not much, but I think for managing the dog and keeping the dog safe um, and also keeping the dog from rehearsing the behavior, we now have a much better basis for figuring out really appropriate ways of doing that. Like um, teaching the dog an I am moving cue. Uh, you know, um, really warning the dog, if you're gonna be walking out of a, of a high con low to high contrast place. But I, I think this often happens in older dogs because of the sensory decline that just comes with age. If they can't see you and they can't hear you, they get startled a lot more often. And, uh, you know, it's almost, it can become almost reflexive to growl, bark, lunge, or even bite as kind of compensation for that. Yeah. And I don't always have the best luck with them, but they make, um, they make like hoop harnesses. So it's like a harness. And then there's like a lightweight hoop around the front. Yeah. So the, do so the dog could feel when it's getting close to something. It doesn't work with stairs, obviously, because they're going to go over that. They won't feel the top of the yeah. stairs. So you have to gate that. And then also they make like little scented stickers you can put around um, mm -hmm. scented little padded things. So I think you can refresh them. So the dog gets to know that this smell is at the top of this stairs right. or at this door, um, which is more a navigational thing. But I don't know if that might help with boundaries for other animals in the yeah. house. And um the one thing I should say too, is that, um, you know, unfortunately there aren't that many veterinary behaviorists. I think there's only 65 in the U S but, um, many of them offer vet to vet consults, which is more sort of less involved, um, than going directly to a veterinary behaviorist. I know many of them, the, um, Tufts like has a long waiting list and there's one resident in Massachusetts, um, Dr. Kirby, um, my favorite, Kirby, she's got a hyphenated name, Matt Madison, maybe. Um, I have her information somewhere. Um, or maybe it's Taylor Kirby. Anyway, I can look it up. Um, but the ones that do vet to vet, you go to your primary care vet and they, ha they have to agree to do it because it's something that they would have to facilitate. But basically, you know, they can give you, you you'll get like a report with recommendations from a veterinary behaviorist. So if it's a if your vet is having trouble figuring out how to give you enough help, but it's not something that may need like a full consult, like that's a really good way. There's um, a veterinary behavior practice in Florida. Lisa Radosta does um, vet to vet and Dr. Pockle in Portland, Oregon also does vet to vet. Lisa Radosta does like emergency ones too, which mm. is helpful. She'll do like really quick ones if it's a situation that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, oh, I don't, I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Is there a, any sort of resource where these names can be accessed? Yeah, um, if you search, I'll put it in the thing. Um, if you wanna find a veterinary behaviorist, you can go to um, 
DACV.org and you can put in your zip code or your city. Unfortunately, the residents are not on there, but I've always been told if you contact the college directly, they'll see if there's a resident in your area because there are about 65 residents. Um, and then let me give you the ones for vet to vet. It's these days too, I mean, even before COVID, um, it's a great use of technology <laughs> to be able to get help, help, you know, no matter where you are. And I don't think, I don't know who else is in New England. That might be, let's see. I don't know how long a waiting list Tufts has for behavior. Last I heard it was like five months. That was a while ago. Oops, sorry, I went through kind of weirdly formatted, but there's Dr. Radasta and Animal Behavior Clinic in Portland. There's two, there's Dr. Pockle and Dr. Pankratz at Animal Behavior Clinic in Portland that both do vet to vet. And then let me look up Taylor. Mass vet behavior, there she is. Taylor Kirby Madden. I was close. I was in Madison. <laughs> she used to work at Angel, but now she started her own. So I think she goes to a VCA one day a month and she's in Dennisport, which I don't know where that is. Is that on the South Shore? I'm actually wondering if, because I'm assuming, uh, and, and if Great Barrington is like the other dog training clubs I know of, that you have members teaching classes. Um, and so I, I was kind of hoping we would get some questions about what to do if uh, a, a dog with aggression issues shows up in your class, um, how to manage, is that, is that true, Sally or Nancy? Is um, people... Dennis Port is on the south shore of the Cape. Just so oh, you know. okay. Yeah. Um, some of there are. Um, I teach scent work, um, but the club does not specifically hold uh, classes. Oh, okay. Uh, we are an all breed. Uh, we are an all breed club. We are. We are more functional in terms of holding um, trials than we are teaching. They used to, they used to hold obedience classes. Um, one of our other members who was on the call um, had a training facility, um, but she's retired now. Okay. So what would you recommend? Because I'm sure people are in classes where there are aggressive dogs. My take on it is remove my dog from anywhere near that aggressive dog. Well, yeah. Uh, and that goes back to the one negative experience, thing, yeah. right? Yeah. All it takes is yeah. one traumatic experience. But if you are the instructor um, and, and uh, you're, you're faced with this, I, I don't teach group classes. The only group class I teach is my control and leash class. And that is a behavioral class. It's not really a, a group training class. But um, I, I think the best thing you can do is take that person aside, ask them to work if you've got a separate room or an enclosed space, ask them to either leave the class and come back and do some private training with you or someone who is qualified to deal with the dog's behavior um, or have that dog working in a, in a separate space. Uh, you really cannot address this in the class setting and it puts other people and other dogs at risk. 
Plus, it takes up a huge amount of your energy, time, and resources because you end up spending the whole class dealing with one or two dogs rather than, you know, everyone who's there in the class. The classes so, that I teach are scent work. So dogs yeah. do not tend to interact. Right. They tend to be on their own. But I'm, I'm yeah. hypersensitive to that because my... Um, my my partner dog, whom I lost last year, was attacked in a in a class early on when she was six months old, and she never got over it. Yeah, and, and she was she was fearful and occasionally aggressive, um, although there was never never any incidents. But she you know she she acted out when she was afraid, and so I am I am hypersensitive to not allowing dogs to. Um, to interact in my classes. Yeah. It, it's hard to, that's why one practice, if for, for example, the Ithaca dog training club, you know, if I could recommend a practice, it would be pre-screening pre anyone who wants to enroll in a puppy class or a, uh, a dog obedience class um, so that so that you can screen out dogs with bite histories or dogs who are struggling with issues that just won't work in a group setting. They really need one-on-one -on -one help with a professional. Um, I also put some virtual classes on there um, for, there's one that does like cooperative care. Like there's, they do have a class on trimming your dog's nails and it's, um, and one, the other one's just general husbandry, but it's put on by a behavior practice in Portland, Oregon called Synergy Behavior. Um, I think they they were they were doing something like that before COVID, but it's really taken off. Mm -hmm. But there, it's more one on one, which is not mm -hmm. one on one, but I think you get more feedback. It's not just watching a webinar. Yeah. Um, Peter, did you have a question? I was going to comment. Um... I'm a member of the Albany Obedience Club. It's an AKC local chapter. And uh, in training classes, they, they encourage the trainers to keep the dogs as separate as possible, to keep them on a, a short leash when they're entering or exiting the building, to, uh, to keep the dogs away from each other when they're moving from their crates into a training area or back into their crates and so on. So they try to minimize the potential for conflicts between dogs. They just sort of recognize that that's a, that's a potential risk when you have a group of dogs and they, they encourage keeping the dogs as separate as possible to avoid the risk of, of conflicts between dogs. And that does seem to help, but it's pretty clear also that, that if a dog has a serious aggression problem, they would eventually ask the person to withdraw the dog from the class. So um, here's a question. How much of a spike do you foresee in aggressive dogs adopted during COVID due to poor socialization through no fault of the owners? It's certainly a hot topic right now, uh, and it's it, it's been a topic for a while too. Is um, and it's something that I think gets it gets kind of emotional. In that, obviously, rescuing dogs is a good thing to do. There are many dogs that don't have homes, but I think some behaviorists have been noticing prior to COVID that there was an increased issue with behavioral problems because we've done a good job as a country in um, decreasing the number of unwanted dogs. So a lot of dogs that are um, you know, now transported all over the country, um, you know, from kill shelters, you know, is this contributing to increased um, behavioral problems? And I don't have a good answer. Certainly, I feel like every time I turn around, someone has a COVID dog <laughs> that they just got that has a problem. But I also am seeing some pets that many, many pets that had, have had problems prior to. So I, there's some early studies that have been coming out trying to get a handle on it in surveys, but I, we might be too much in the middle of it to really know if I'm, you know, whether in the forest or the trees, like whether we just feel like we're seeing it because everyone's talking about it, I don't know. What do you think, Laura? Well, I think the problem is not with COVID. I think the problem is with the explosion 
of rescues of all kinds, many of which don't do their due diligence with the dog and adopt out dogs who have aggression issues. They have actual bite histories. I mean, I, um, <laughs> I could tell you some stories, but th this is actually, I, I on a, this is one of the few things, I'm usually a pretty mild mannered person, but one thing that makes me angry is working with someone who adopted a dog from a rescue was not told their whole history, now is struggling with an aggressive dog, um, and they also get a response from the, from the rescue. Well, we, we dealt with that, you know, so the adopter is just left on their own to, to deal with this dog. I, I think that is incredibly irresponsible behavior. Um, I, I will say this year, <clears throat> I've had an unusually no, high number of dogs that have had to be euthanized for behavior reasons. More this year than any year I've ever been practicing. And at least two of them, one of them uh, was a dog and I'm not gonna name the rescue or the breed of the dog who came with the bite history. The rescue had sent the dog to a three day board and train shock collar camp. And then they said the aggression issue was resolved. They adopted the dog out to this person who was a single, uh, a single person, you know, ha busy uh, work life. And the dog within two days of arriving in her house, bit three of her friends. Um, and then uh, just like a month ago, started biting her. Um, and she called the rescue and they said, good luck, because we solved that problem. Um, so this is another one. I think this dog was not safe. And I, I didn't think we would ever be able to make this dog safe enough to be in a regular home. Um, so the dog was euthanized. But I see this as a greater issue with rescues than anything that has to do with the pandemic or COVID. And I, I'll get off my soapbox now, um, but I would say, you know, I, I think that is now a huge problem in the, in the dog world and the dog training world. Um, so I'm just being blunt about it, but I, I think it is something that those of us who work with the fallout <laughs> from that, who work with these people, uh, really, really, I feel like we have we have to deal with this. Um, yeah, I don't it's hard. Know. Yeah, when yeah. I was in gen, I did have to always remind myself when I was in general practice for many years that I would see lots of rescue dogs that fit very well into their new home. Yeah, and did and adjust, you know, with some adjustment, but you know, did very well. I think it is hard now being biased because I do feel like I see the worst case scenario or very difficult situations. I, I feel, feel like actually things are a little bit better because I feel like Cornell wasn't seeing as many behavior cases. So when I first started my residency, every case was, you've got two weeks to f fix this dog or we're going to euthanize it. Yeah. Um, it, I was really depressed the first year of my <laughs> residency. And I actually feel like now I, you know, you know, I know Laura, I know other, you know, other trainers in Rochester, and they send me cases before it gets to that point. So um, yeah, it's hard. It's really hard to know. Um, we all, I think everyone has the best of intentions and wants the best thing for those animals, but it's, um, it, it's a difficult debate to have, you know, I th and I know that there's a lot of, you know, I've heard some very tense conversations amongst veterinarians who, you know, are either pro breeder, breeder or rescue, you know, reputable breeder versus rescue. And I think that um, it's, it's unfortunate to um, place judgment on it. I think we just have to think about the, what's best for those animals and do what we can. And the people, you know, mm -hmm. no one, if someone doesn't feel safe at home or can't live with a dog, then that's difficult. 
Here's a question. There's a someone posted that, that they have a friend who can't get on get on for because of computer in, issues. Who wants to know what is your opinion on ENS in puppies? E, what is ENS? I do not know. Do you know, Kate? <laughs> Guess not. No, I can Google it. <laughs> All right, we will find out. Environmental neurological syndrome. What? Oh, early, early neurological stimulation. Ah, oh. well, I wasn't too far off. <laughs> Never heard of it. It sounds like gentling in, in uh, foals. Have you heard of gentling? Yeah. That was big for a while. I don't, I think that was debunked, but. Here's another question. Do your methods work for either virtual or in person? I guess that's to, to you, Laura. I'm not absolutely sure. It doesn't say. Well, we're both still just doing virtual. I, I'm still only doing Zoom sessions, although I'm going to start outdoor in, pu you know, in public places, um, occasional sessions, probably next month but here's what i would say here's what i've discovered for, because for the last year that's all i've been doing just like kate is online zoom consults one-to-one -one behavior consults and for most of the dogs i work with it actually works better it works better because dogs who worry about the environment dogs who are struggling with aggression issues, dogs who are struggling with territorial or fear issues. If you actually come into the household, that adds a whole nother layer of stress onto the dog. And usually you spend the first session dealing with that, getting around it. There, there's a, there are many things that are going on. I've actually found that I can do much more productive training specifically with dogs struggling with aggression issues um, in, a, in my online format. Um, mine is a little different from Kate's because I have ongoing sessions with these dogs and I do a lot of real time coaching through the screen. So we're actually doing training exercises I'm working with the dog. I'll work with the dog outside. People join on their cell phone and we'll, we'll go through, we'll do a walk, we'll go through exercises outside. But I have actually found it to be more productive for dogs struggling with aggression. And I'm keeping it as a permanent part of my um, offering. I, I really am. I, I think it's been a boon. I think it's actually been very productive. Yeah, I agree. I think as um, legally as a veterinarian, you you know, the FDA, well, some of the practice acts, it varies from state to state. I don't, in Massachusetts, I think it's similar to New York, but um, you know, it's always been understood that we would see our patients in person in order to make a diagnosis and prescribe medication. Um, and vets have always been very resistant to any sort of telemedicine because they didn't see a lot of added benefit. I'm not speaking for everyone. There are vets, I think, who saw the benefits. But um, I think for behavior, I, I probably will continue to do parts of it remotely because it is, yeah, it is, I can have a much calmer conversation. I feel like um, people can listen more. They're not stressed about their dog. You know, it, it's not very helpful to sit in a little exam room for a long period of time talking while their dog is barking at everything that walks by, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. depends on the dog, but it's often a very stressful experience. So I think I'm going to continue to incorporate that as part of the very first initial meeting mm -hmm. and then do a follow-up in person and then maybe another follow-up remotely. Um, it's been really, really uh, helpful. I've been, it's, it's kind of a, not that anything really good came out of the pandemic, but I'm actually really glad that we're at this place with learning how to do all mm -hmm. these things. Um, okay, oh, I just, the early neurological stimulation is something that my dog's breeder has done with her litters. She has shepherds and labs. And I have to say that my dog, I really truly believe has benefited 
benefited from this. It's a, it's just, you know, playing with the toes and playing with the ears and rubbing and turning them around and just generally touching them and giving them stimulation um, and interaction early on. Um, yeah, there was a study in rodents that showed that if, the, I mean, it sounds, it sounds so sad, but they took pups away from their mother and they didn't get any um, tactile stimulation from their mother when they were a certain age. Um, and they just discovered that those pups didn't develop um, the correct uh, cortisol receptors in their brain. So if they were dealing with a stress, they couldn't actually downregulate the cortisol. Um, and so there's all kinds, and I think there was more to the study than that, but I think, um, yeah, there's definitely something to, you know, early handling. I think they have done studies too, looking at like um, puppies and kittens being handled at certain ages by people and how does that affect their behavior later? I, I don't know anything about like the neurologic component of it, that there's a specific um, goal in mind with that, but I think any sort of like it's been shown that uh, shelter dogs benefit from deep massage. Like I think any sort of tactile, um, because dogs are very, so, and, and dogs develop an affinity and a social um, structure, you know, uh, connection with people. Um, there's also been studies that show that oxytocin levels in dogs and people increase when we um, do massage or stroke dogs. So um, I think it, there's probably something to it. I just never heard of that specific method and I don't know what the, the neurologic well, I think it's an, is. I think it's an offshoot from what they've been discovering with preemies um, when they're in the incubators in the hospitals that if they don't, if they aren't touched and they aren't held and they aren't, you know, even if they're too, too little or too um, undeveloped to, to get out really out of their um, incubators that, that the nurses come in and touch them and talk to them. And, and, uh, and I think that this is just a, an extension of that research, which has been, I think, pretty well proven that it's extremely effective and makes a big difference. Are you familiar with the puppy culture program? Yep. Highly recommend it. And someone asked, any suggestions for a fearful single event learner? How to help the dog to learn, understand that new things aren't scary. Um, I guess I would say break down that event. I mean, I think over time you have to start with something simple and then gradually work up depending on what the scary thing is, um, depending on the age of the dog and you know, other factors, um, they definitely would benefit from sort of a holistic management plan and then, um, you know, building in predictability. And um, I always find dogs that are anxious like to know what's, what's gonna happen and what's expected of them. So practicing those behaviors and reinforcing them um, so that they get some confidence and then, um, you know, targeting specific behavior modification exercises towards being relaxed in different situations very slowly. Um, and it may be worth talking to a veterinarian or vet behaviorist about medication. If it's really extreme, it may be appropriate, but they, they would definitely want more information. I think that might be it. It's a quarter. Okay. You guys must be quite tired. We ended up getting a good amount of questions. <laughs> It's just it's just a getting people to ask the initial one. Yeah. Start once somebody breaks the ice, <laughs> people chime in. I just wanted to say thank you again for this program. We're so delighted to have you, um, and I'm sure all of us have learned a great deal. You're welcome. We really have to meet everybody. Your time, very valuable. It was terrific get a lot of wonderful thank you thank you great info this, <laughs> this is great thank you i enjoy this is totally great oh good good i'm yes. definitely going to rewatch this and i'm i'm really grateful to all of you for putting this forth because it's it's been really interesting and really informative so i'm going to definitely watch it again yeah it was very good thank you everyone great Thank you. Bye. Thanks for your time. Stay well and safe.
Yes, yeah. go, pet, go pet your dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hug them, but pet them. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to copy all of the information that you posted in the, the um, comments. So, um, actually, you can, uh, you can save it as a file. I can, how do I save it as a file? Let me see. Just go to the dots, save I, chat. I am. Go to, go to the, click on the chat button. Wait, click on the chat button. And it, you see the, the button, it says file, and then three dots on the lower right-hand side. And it says save chat. I see chat. <laughs> oh, look look down look to, to where you're typing oh, a message. Yeah. 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 Hello. Yeah. Back. All right, there we go. There it is. Save chat. Yeah, super. Thanks. All right, bye everybody. All right, have a bye. good night again. All righty. Good night all. Bye. Bye.